We are beginning whether we like it or not. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am glad to see you. Uh, I am not mic'd up because they tell me that the magical ambient mics will pick up what I say. Uh, but here we are together to study the Word of God. And this evening I am taking a slightly different tack on the material of the last part of Genesis than you are used to. This evening, uh, due to David's prodding about Genesis 38, we are going to be talking about the Judah narrative in Genesis. And we will be skipping all of the Joseph parts that we're used to, and focusing instead on just what it is that Judah is up to and why this matters. Before we begin, though, Troy, would you mind leading us in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you, recognizing you as our uh, God, our Creator, our King, our Ruler, our Redeemer. We thank you so much for being our God and the opportunity we have to be your children through the blood of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this opportunity to learn from your Word. We pray that you would be with Matt and the other teachers this evening, that things that they have prepared for us, they will present them in a way that we can easily understand them. And then when we find them to be true to your word, that we would take them as applications to our lives so that we may be better Christians. Continue to be with us. Give us wisdom and to continue to search your word and seek your guidance in our everyday lives. We ask all this through the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Christ. All right. Uh, as I said, Judah, but first we need to start by talking about other people than Judah. Slide. So, first topic that I want for us to discuss. What events take place in Genesis 34, the last two verses there, and in Genesis 35, 32? In Genesis 49, 1 through 7, what are the consequences? What does this lead us to anticipate about Jacob's blessing on his heir? So, uh, let's start off with some reading then. Who would like to read those two verses at the end of Genesis 34? Logan, read away, brother. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, Should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Okay, thank you, brother. So what's all this about? Why is Jacob mad at Simeon and Levi here? Yeah. What is that? They avenged Diana's rape. Or the way they avenged Yes, by rape. slaughtering a whole bunch of people. Yes, the, they took advantage of, uh, shall we say, post-circumcision trauma to go in and slaughter all of the people in the town of Shechem, in the city of Shechem. And how does Jacob feel about this? Bad idea. You know, it's interesting. We get echoes of this story much later in uh, John 4. Because in the story of the Canaanite woman at the well, or the Samaritan woman at the well with whom Jesus talks, what's the town that they are near? Sychar, same town as Shechem. And so why is this called Jacob's Well that they're talking around? Because he dug it. And what do we know about the well? Is this one where they struck water after a few feet? No. No, what does the text say there? <laughs> yeah, I might be outrunning everyone's memory. I'll, I'll spoil everyone and say that the well is deep. So this is a place where Jacob came in, bought some land, and dug a deep well. What does that imply about his plans? And by deep, I mean, the well is still there. It's dozens of feet deep. Uh, so what does that imply about his plans, probably? Yeah, he thinks he's going to settle down here. And Simeon and Lou, Levi, with their bloodthirstiness and craftiness, blow it all up. Okay, let's go on to Genesis 35.22. Who would like to read that? Granted. 
While Israel was living in that region, Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah. And Israel heard about it. Right. Jake, I'm sorry, go on. Oh, Jacob had 12 sons. <laughs> okay. So, I want to focus on the first part of that. What do we see Reuben being up to? Yeah, not good things. He has slept with his father's company, <coughs> uh, who elsewhere in the story is called his wife. And how does that rate in the biblical scale of bad things to do? <coughs> yes, yeah, that's really bad. You, you remember Paul's comment on the man who has his father's wife in 1 Corinthians? Uh, what does he say about it? Well, even the Gentiles don't do this. Yeah, even the Gentiles don't do this. Everybody knows this is awful. And so uh, when we see Reuben doing this, even though Reuben comes across as a pretty nice guy elsewhere in the book sometimes, uh, this is really just bad behavior that is beyond the pale. There's no excuse for this. Okay. Uh, the usurpation of the authority? He's yeah. basically trying to supplant his daughter. Well, yeah, he, I mean, literally he does. And that has uh, symbolic implications. Because, uh, for instance, what does Absalom do with the women that David leaves behind to keep house when he flees Jerusalem? He puts a tent on the roof and does it in front of everybody in the nation. Yeah, and it's to make exactly that statement. That, okay, we're, we're done with Dad, it's my turn now. Uh, so, bad stuff for Reuben. Okay, let's move on then to Genesis 49, 1 through 7. Uh, a little bit longer, but I think we know how to pronounce all the names in it, so it should not be an intimidating <coughs> reading. Dan. <clears throat> then Jacob summoned his sons and said, Assemble yourselves that I may tell you what will befall you in the days to come. Gather together and hear, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and my beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Uncontrolled as water, you shall not have preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it, you went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers, their swords are implements of violence. Let my soul not enter into their council. Let not my glory be united with their assembly, because in their anger they slew <coughs> men, and in their self-will they lamed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Right. So, here we are working through the birth order of Jacob's sons, looking for the one who gets the blessing. Uh, Re Reuben is the firstborn. Does he get it? No. Nope. No. Why? Because he's... Uh, because he's yeah. And Jacob makes no bones about this. Uh, how about Simeon and Levi, numbers two and three? Nope. Nope. And again, we've discussed their problem, haven't we? So Jacob is working through his sons at a pretty rapid rate, it seems. Uh, and... So what does this lead us to anticipate about Jacob's blessing on his heir, forgetting all else that we know about this story? Uh, who is next in line? Judah. Yes, D Judah is number four. Okay, so it's time to start talking about him. Slide. <coughs> what happens in Genesis 37, 18 through 28? What do we learn about Judah at this time in his life? So, who would like to read that? Charming <coughs> little narrative there. 18 to 20. I'll get it. Um, they saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. 
And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty, there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh, and their way to carry it uh, down to Egypt. On their way to carry it down to Egypt, then Judah said to his brothers, "What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh." And his brothers listened to him. Then. Uh, Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. Right. Okay. So, first of all, uh, in this, what do we learn about all of Joseph's brothers, all, all ten of them at this point? Are these really good guys, lots of family solidarity? Couldn't stand it. Yeah, they, they hated him. And so we see strife of brother against brother, uh, family betraying family. Uh, what's the original plan? Kill him. Kill him. Kill him. And who keeps this from being carried out immediately? Reuben. Mm -hmm. Reuben. So, you know, Reuben is grossly immoral, but at least he does this <laughs> nice thing. Uh, so he's got that going for him, which is nice. Um, uh, moving on, uh, who is the having other name? Having some sway with the word nice, having some sway with the word nice, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, moving on, who is the other named character in the story? Judah. 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 Uh, does he end up kind of saving Joseph's life? Uh, does he do this because he has compassion in his heart? No. No. Um, uh, so, what's his motivation for saving Joseph? Money and trying to make him Yeah, he, he wants he wants money. He says, you know, if we if we just kill him, then we don't get anything out of that except satisfaction. But if we sell him into slavery, now there's the ticket. Uh, it's revenge. It's money. This is the strategy. So uh, they sell him for twenty pieces of silver, uh, which works out to an even rate of two shekels per brother. And they, uh, off Joseph goes on the caravan to Egypt. So, uh, what do we think of Judah here? Not much. Yes. Uh, does this look like a promising recipient of the blessing, especially a promising recipient of the promise that through him all the nations of the earth will be blessed? No. No. I mean, sometimes God uses strange people, but this is a guy who apparently doesn't even like his own family, who is perfectly willing to sell his brother into slavery for the sake of his own profit. This is uh, not somebody who really shines at this point in the story. Yes, sir? You know, there's one other aspect of this I've kind of thought about, and that is you kind of got to ask yourself, about Judah because really the birthright belonged to Reuben and it was clear his dad wasn't going to give it to Reuben. Clearly the, the two that came after him, his two brothers, they didn't do something so he lost it. And from Judah's perspective, little little Joseph down here is the guy that dad likes the most and you know, what's in it for the rest of us? I mean, I, I think there might be sort of a couple of different feelings of jealousy going on here. Number one, that hit the older brothers that should have gotten selected weren't, and the younger brother who should have been the last one on the list is now the first one on the list, and it's like, something's got to be done. This, yes. is, this is all messed up, you know. Dad is off his rocker, we got to go fix this. And, get, rid of, get rid of Joseph was one of the ways of getting it fixed, in their mind. And that may be completely accurate, because all the way through this story, uh, has the birthright followed the expected course? No. No, it's jumped around to somebody who is somebody's favorite. And who looks like the clear favorite at this point? Joseph. 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 And, you know, uh, 
Jacob seems pretty indifferent to the rest of them. So, you know, maybe this is Judah kind of elbowing his way back into the limelight. Uh, also, incidentally, what do you think would have happened if Jacob found out, like, before Genesis 48, that uh, Reuben, or uh, excuse me, that Judah had volunteered to sell his darling boy into slavery? Who else is getting disinherited? <laughs> so it, it is very interesting how things turn here. Any other comments at this point? Well, it's also interesting that it all turned out for the better. What Judah did actually helped. I mean, yes. not that God needed the help, but God used it to help with Jacob's family and ultimately during the famine in yes. Egypt. And it is certainly worth remembering that all the way through this, we see the workings of providence. Sometimes in obvious ways that are labeled, sometimes in less obvious ways that aren't. Uh, could I have a handkerchief or something else? Sorry about that, my, one of my eyes bothering me. But I think we can go on to the next slide, assuming I can see it. So, uh, Phooey, this, uh, would someone else mind reading this slide for me while I try and uh, de-sting my eyes? Describe the narrative of Genesis 38. How should we analyze these events in the context of the promises made to Abraham? Great. So, uh, simple question, lots of discussion. We are not going to read all of Genesis 38 and all of its sordid glory, but let's talk about what happens here. So somebody give me the, the basic fact pattern. How does it start? He leaves his family. What's that? He leaves his family. Who does? Judah. Yeah, he's off by himself. And so when he's off uh, amongst the people of the land, whom does he marry? Canaanite. He marries a Canaanite. Uh, and this is a great place to remember that the Bible doesn't provide us details for no reason. So he marries the Canaanite. What is the result of the marriage? have a son named Ur. Okay, they have a son named Ur. Uh, any other offspring here from this marriage? Onan. We have Onan. And uh, finally we have? Sheila. Sheila. So, uh, what choice does Ur make when he gets older? He marries a woman named Tamar. How is she labeled? Or is she? So we are, we are very definite that Shua is a Canaanite. Is Tamar labeled as a Canaanite? Okay, so we have non-Canaanite women. So that, that's a good start. But the, another problem comes up. What starts happening? Her dies, son die. Yeah, uh, Ur dies. And then we go on to husband number two, who is Onan, and he dies. So uh, it kind of reminds me of my mother-in-law's mother who worked her way through four husbands. Uh, you know, uh, Tamar is kind of on the same track here. And so who is supposed to be next? Sheila. Uh, does that happen? What happened? Judah won't give him to her. Uh, Judah won't give him to her. So we have the woman through whom offspring is supposed to come. She is not having any offspring. Sheila is not having any offspring yet. So what does this mean for the promise to Abraham if uh, Judah is the heir? Uh, are things looking good? No. No. We, we are not having the, uh, the children that we need to have. And if you remember David's discussion that 
problems with babies are a theme of Genesis. Here it is again, except this time it's a different kind of baby problem. That despite this promise of the, the nation and the, the seed and all the rest, uh, this doesn't obviously <coughs> seem to be working. So, how do things get unstuck? Who unsticks them? Tamar. 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 Yes, Tamar takes matters into her own hands, and she pretends to be a prostitute. prostitute. Uh, and it is interesting to note that the way that prostitutes signified themselves back then was by veiling their faces. So she has got her, her face covered pretending to be a prostitute, which is how Judah doesn't twig to what's going on here. And so Judah is having a good time with his Canaanite buddy, and he sees the prostitute. Mm -hmm. uh, what does he do about that? Goes into her. Yes, he, he does not pass by on the other side. And so, uh, what is the result of this little encounter? Baby. Yes, uh, Tamar turns up pregnant. And how does Judah react to this? Kill her. Kill her. Well, yeah, she's gone off with some other man. And... Yes. Although the the precise words here are interesting. Well, what exactly does he condemn her for doing? Yes, she has played the harlot, says Judah. Uh, the, the, there may be slight irony there. <laughs> Uh, and he may also not yet know just how right he was. Uh, so, uh, Judah uh, calls for her to be destroyed, uh, calls for her to be burned, and uh, what happens instead? She provides proof that he's the father. Yes, she brings out the uh, staff and signet cord that he had given her as a pledge for the young goat that uh, she had earned for her availability. Um, and what is Judah's conclusion about this? She's more righteous than me. More she righteous. is more righteous than I am. And so, yeah, here we are with this story. It's wild. Yes. The more, well, it's not like it's the first one time you would go through it. It is just wild every single time you go through it. Yes. Uh, I feel um, like we need like a little family tree that like no longer forks. You know, like. Yes. I don't know, man. It's just wild. And, well, uh, let's finish off the it fact pattern. Every single time. I can't keep it straight. Yes. Uh, <laughs> What sort of child slash children does Tamar end up having? Twins. 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 Here we go again. And the first one is? Perez. Uh, is he the first to make an appearance? No. 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 Who is that? Zara. Zara. And then Zara goes back in and Perez emerges. So. Um, just to spoil her a little bit, of all of uh, Judah's descendants, to whom does the blessing pass through? Perez is the one who is in the lineage of David and Jesus and all the rest. So, uh, we, let, let's take a quick survey. Uh, probably many of us did children's Bible classes on the book of Genesis, right? We, we remember studying this coming up as kids. How, how many of us studied Genesis 38 as children? <laughs> no. Uh, uh, there was Man, no you get to the code and then you just ditch the rest of this <laughs> when you're a kid. Like you get to the code of many colors and then the rest of it, no. We, yes. don't, we don't do it. Uh, the, the, there is no flannel graph for this one, thankfully. Flannel graph? Yeah. Susan's like, I've got a I hope not. Uh, so, wild story. Bunch of people behaving in all sorts of bad ways. How do we make sense of this 
in the context of the promise made to Abraham. Yes, sir? I mean, there are so many bad things that happen here, it's just mind-boggling. But what it does show, I think, is that in, in lieu of what man can do to mess things up, God can still work his purpose. Yes. And I think this is an example of that. I mean, everything that was done in chapter 38, we all go, oh my goodness, you have got to be kidding me, right? Because none of this would be anything that people would seemingly normally do. Right. Even, even in our society today, I think people would look at this as, that's really messed up. Yes. Okay? Um, and yet they did that. And yet God was able to still bring Jesus through that lineage, which means that, that God's foresight in, into how all of this played out, God never <clears throat> lost sight of the vision or the goal right. that he needed to have. That, that somehow God is able to make this mess work out for his glory and according to the plan. Right. And that is the, the sort of the, the headline here. But let's look at some of the awful things that people do. Uh, where does the list start? It's, it's not even in something that's obviously wrong, I don't think. It starts with marrying a Canaanite woman. Yeah, it starts with marrying a Canaanite woman. Because what have we learned all the way through Genesis about who the sons of the promise are supposed to marry? You know, what? Definitely not Canaanites. Definitely not Canaanites. Uh, when... Uh, for instance, Ishmael married an Egyptian woman. Was that good? No. Uh, when Esau married a Canaanite, was that good? No. And so here again, we see the, the same bad thing where you have uh, one of the uh, sons of the promise going and associating with the people of the land and intermarrying with the people of the land. So, uh, we suspect that this is not what God wants. Uh, how do we see proof that this is not what God wants? Well, there, there's an interesting thing in verse 4 when it's talking about her and, and uh, the, the following, I guess, the following verses. But it, it talks about the Lord putting them to death. Yes. I don't know about the rest of you, but there's a lot of ways to die. But when it says the Lord puts you to death, you got to be a really bad person to have that happen. Um, yes. And so we don't know exactly how bad Ur was, but he was bad enough that God stepped in and said, you're done. Yes. Uh, Ur got smite buttoned. We yep. don't know why. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> but uh, that, that's what happened to him. So when, you, when God stepped in and started removing certain individuals out of this, that also shows that God's direct intervention into what, what was yes. going on with the events that was Because happening. were these the right heirs? No, and they had problems of their own. And one can only imagine how bad Ur was as opposed to all the rest of his family. Right. Because we get to see the rest of them that live through this, and we're looking at these things that they're doing thinking, this is terrible, how much worse can they be? But clearly there was somebody worse who get the yes. smite button, which I'll be using that phrase because I like that a lot. <laughs> but so you have to think, like, we're not even really told about it, but it must have been so just abysmal that it's we push that button. Even yes. though we, we, we're seeing all these other things that are horrible, and those people are just left to live their lives and do it and continue being terrible people. But some are so bad. Yeah. And so just, they have even no place that, like, they just. And not just bad, but subverting the promise. Because part of Onan's issue is he says, I'm the heir, but I'm just not going to have kids with Tamar. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have hit a dead end there because when it comes to flawed heir number three, who, by the way, does not get the promise or the blessing, uh, he is not going to have kids either. So in to save the day in a really odd way is Tamar. And we have uh, Shua the Canaanite. We have Tamar the non-Canaanite. So which of these looks like the woman to whom the promise should, uh, through whom the promise should come? Tamar. 
neither should be Tamar. <laughs> it, might, it should be, but neither of them are from the right family clan that we can tell. Well, we, we don't know. All we do know about Tamar is that uh, she is not identified as a Canaanite, right. as opposed to the billboard identifying Shua as a Canaanite. Yeah, but the fact that she's not identified at all really is suspect as well. It, we don't know that she's good. We do know that she's not bad. Yeah, right, right. I'm just like talking about her being her being of the yes. of the right families, if you will. Yes. And, and so, uh, how does the promise get back on track? We have this one. Uh, weird encounter and that produces uh, two boys who are of the right lineage, one of whom is the heir. Um, now let's close our consideration of this strange story with uh, Judah's last words. What does he say? You are my yeah, she was more righteous than I. Now, who in Judah's whole family would say anything like this? How many people in the lineage of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are willing to say, I blew it? David? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years in the future, yeah. David. But uh, of the folks in Genesis, because uh, what, for instance, uh, did Reuben and Simeon, or no, excuse me, Simeon and Levi say when uh, Jacob said, you've offended all these people I wanted to be neighbors with? Just want us to let us, let us. Them defiled. Yeah, they didn't say, whoops, sorry, Dad, we blew it. They said, well, we were right to do this, and you're wrong. And uh, they kind of have a point, sort of. Uh, as usual, there are no good guys. But uh, they are certainly not admitting wrongdoing. So Judah is the first one who does, which is interesting. Uh, anything else here? Any other? Eric? I, I'm just gonna say I think once again we are seeing um, God through Moses's writings telling the Israelites, "You're not worth what I'm giving you, right? Like you look at look at everything that you've come from. Even even Abraham, who you hold in such high regard, look at all the bad things that he's done. You know, it it's it's just this continuous." You're not worthy of what is happening, but I'm still being merciful. It, it's it's that yes. it's that overtone of, of constant mercy. Yes, it's almost like uh, Paul's argument in Romans nine about how it's not because of the flesh. That's not how the promise comes. The promise never comes according to the flesh. That instead it is because of the promise and because of God's mercy. And certainly we see that mercy in abundant display, where uh, the only thing that gets God's will back on track is this woman pretending to be a prostitute. So he's dealing with some really, uh, really earthen vessels here. One other thing that I would say is, I, I think most of us here are Gentiles, right, for, yeah. in, in that sense. And so how much more should we be grateful to God and his mercy that he took this admittedly flawed family and, and saved us all when, you know, look at, look at us. Look at, look at what our lineage really is. Yes. And... Uh, we are well outside the frame of Genesis. Right. I mean, uh, there are occasional Christians who are Jewish, but it, it's not common. And yet, God used his mercy toward a few, or as it also says in Romans 9, that he endured with great, uh, great patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. 
that he put up with all of that. He patiently and mercifully worked his will with these people who didn't deserve it so that he could show far more mercy to all of us who didn't deserve it in a way that none of these people would have imagined. So, Yeah, Matt, just real quick. This is not the last time God uses a, a harlot in no. the lineage of Christ. Yeah. No, that, that is so, an interesting that, point. And real quick, uh, who are the four women who are named in the lineage of Christ? Matthew 1. Uh, Bible trivia question. Ruth is one of them. Ruth is one of them. Rahab. 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 Tamar. Tamar. And Mary. 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 That's it. And are any of these women just so uh, in, in terms of uh, whom you would uh, think that God would choose to carry the promise through? Well, Mary. Ruth was a friend. Uh, you know, Ruth was a Moabitess. Yeah. Uh, Tamar pretended to be a prostitute. Rahab was a prostitute. And a Canaanite. And, you know, we, we know the truth about Mary. Uh, what did everybody in Mary's time think about Mary? Fornicator. Yes, she's, she's a fornicator. And you see echoes of this in John 8 off the top of my head when the Jews say to Jesus, we were not born of fornication. We have Abraham as our father. And what that, at that point in the conversation, Jesus gets really mad. He, he starts accusing them of being children of the devil. And that is because he did not miss the insult. That they are suggesting that this woman who really was guiltless uh, had in fact done something scandalous that her husband covered up because he was a nice guy. So... You know, there too, some really unlikely candidates among the women who are foregrounded in the lineage of Christ, uh, which should remind us that God does not do things our way, no, not at all. Well, all the way through Genesis, we have the flannel graph pictures in our head. You know, Abraham and Sarah are these doddering, sweet old people who have a baby unexpected. They're terrible people. Like, all the way through the book of Genesis, these are terrible people. And yet God says, these are the ones that I want to use for my plan. Yes. This, these are the ones that I handpicked to be my people. Despite the fact that I'm sitting here going, oh, well, she's more righteous than Judah is. I don't know many people who aren't yeah. more righteous than Judah is. No, not a high bar there. But this is who God chose. <laughs> kind of, too. Build on that, I guess. I mean, Abraham had his faults, but he was a man of faith. That's why yes. the promise went to him. And mm -hmm. the promise was fulfilled to Abraham. It wasn't, it was carried through all these other people, but it was a promise to Abraham. Yes. So God, a covenant. God met his covenant. Now, Abraham's people didn't. Yeah. But it was to Abraham that God made the promise, and God fulfilled his promise. Yes. And it is worth remembering that even though we are dealing with uh, terrible people, these are people of faith. And they found uh, favor in the eyes of God, not because they did everything right, but because they were faithful to the promise, even if they messed everything else up. I mean, we've seen what a stinker Jacob was. And yet, Hebrews 11 records him as a man of faith because of the blessing that he gives in Genesis 49, if, we, uh, if I don't talk too much when we get there. So, all right. Uh, anything else here? Okay, slide. How does Judah interact with Jacob in Genesis 43, 1 through 9? What stands out about this conversation? And somebody give me a time check. Ten minutes. Five to ten. Uh, ten minutes. All right. Uh, we will not read that then. Uh, uh, let, let's summarize. What's the conversation here? They went down to Egypt to get the grain. Then Joseph demanded that they be Yep. And he's, he's going, his father, and he has to bring the other brother. Yes. 
Okay, so you know, th their hand is forced here. They don't really want to go back down to Egypt. Weird stuff happens in Egypt. Uh, but uh, the famine continues. They can't get food anywhere else. And Joseph has said, don't come back without your, own, your youngest brother. So this is how things have to be. But there is something else interesting that uh, Judah says at the end. How, why does Jacob finally consent to this besides just naked necessity? <coughs> Judah promises to take care of him, whatever it takes. It yeah. seems like he's learned from yep. his mistake. Yes. Uh, before we see uh, Judah selling his brother into slavery, now he offers his life for his brothers. That uh, if, if I fail to take care of him, then I'll, I'll come back and you can do whatever you want with me. So again, uh, do we see anybody else in the Genesis narrative doing something like this? Uh, promising their life in exchange for someone else's? Or are they all bunch, a bunch of really narrow-minded, self-interested stinkers? Yes. Yes. A, option B is the correct one. So, uh, again, even though Judah is not really the, the main character of this narrative, he kind of is. Because he is the one who is really showing moral development. Uh, and it, it's not really my text. But should we really be impressed with Joseph's behavior as uh, Pharaoh's right-hand man in Egypt toward his brothers? Uh, I mean, when he's like deceiving them about who he is and playing games with them and making false accusations. He's you know, a little spiteful. Yeah, a little he's bit. testing. He's testing them. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's the, the usual line. Oh. But it's, it's a very drama. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he he is uh, definitely, I think, showing that he is Jacob's son. Uh, it, it is usually said that he is one of the, the super righteous people in the Bible, but I don't see it. Uh, we make excuses for all of his lying and manipulation because we think he's righteous, but he's really not. Uh, so... Uh, that, that's just in passing. That one's extra. Um, <laughs> let's move on to the, the next one. Uh, once more, a really fascinating passage we don't have time to read. Uh, according to Genesis 40, uh, 44, 14 through 34, what does Judah say to Joseph after Joseph has framed Benjamin with the silver cup? Again, Joseph, not a great guy. Uh, what does this show us about him? Why is it significant? So, uh, we know the story, right? Uh, Joseph plants the silver cup in Benjamin's sack, sends uh, men after them to uh, uncover the quote-unquote crime. Uh, they all are dragged back before Joseph, and Joseph says, because your brother has done this horrible thing, he has to stay with me. So that sets the, the stage for what Judah says. What does Judah say? He offers yeah, he offers himself. He says, uh, don't uh, take Benjamin into slavery. Uh, at, at this point, uh, does Judah know that this was a plant? No. no. What does he most likely believe? Benjamin probably stole the cup. Yeah, he thinks Benjamin stole the cup. So instead of saying uh, new favorite number two, or new favorite of dad, uh, a little squirt is about to get what he deserves, he intervenes. And he offers himself to Pharaoh in Judah's place. And what's his motivation? He promised his dad that he would take care of him. Yeah, he promised his dad. And what is he worried about happening if they all go back to? Uh, Canaan without Benjamin. Uh, kill yeah, he's worried that he is going to kill his father. So let's zoom out a little bit. 
and look at this story from a uh, 20,000 20, foot perspective. Do we know anyone else in the Bible uh, who, for the sake of his father, uh, offers himself, though guiltless, for the sake of the guilty? Jesus. Yep. Uh, there is a big type lurking right here under our noses that we usually ignore because we're focused on Joseph. Uh, also, what do we think about Judah's behavior here? Is he just sort of being morally sketchy like the rest of his family? No. He seems to have actually learned something over the years and grown. Yeah. Yes. Matured. Yeah. That's what his father went through with Joseph. He can't. He doesn't want to see his father go through that again. Yes. It, I mean, he's been privy to what this has done to his father. Yeah. Uh, does. Judah know at this point that he's not the favorite. And he seems to love his father despite the fact that he's yes. not the favorite. Uh, he is loyal and steadfast <clears throat> to his father, even though he knows he's not the favorite. And is true to his, true to his word, even at what he thinks will be great personal cost to himself. So, you know, if we're going to celebrate anybody uh, in the book of Genesis, it probably should be Judah. So then, on a slide. Uh, I will read past. Uh, what blessing does Jacob pronounce in Genesis 49, 8 through 12? Why is this appropriate? What does he say about son number four? Uh, are we getting reasons why he doesn't get the blessing? Yeah, he gets the blessing. And, in fact, it is through the lineage, not just of Judah, but also Perez, who was kind of uh, son number three, but ends up being son number one, uh, that uh, David comes, all the kings come, and Jesus comes. So, this is a guy who did the right thing, having no idea how significant that would prove to be. So, what do we think of the appropriateness of the way the story ends? Who are we to judge, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Judah was definitely human. Uh, did lots of bad things, made lots of mistakes, and yet is somebody who learned from those mistakes. And maybe right along with Abraham is the only one who occasionally showed nobility of character. And that's where the story leaves us. We have lots of stuff in there about Joseph, which is appropriate because he's going to be the ultimate father of the tribe of Ephraim, which is really significant. But for our purposes, uh, does the lineage of Joseph really go anywhere? No. It is ultimately Judah and his descendants that we care about. Uh, any closing comments? Logan. Yeah, just a funny observation. I don't think Joseph would have been sold into slavery if he just kept his mouth shut. Uh, also correct. Uh, you can belabor uh, David with your Joseph observations next week. Thank you all for your comments.